James is considered by many to be one of the greatest English language novelists of all time. But back when I was an English major in college, I could never get myself to finish any of his novels. His writing is not my cup of tea, I guess. It's dense and complicated and frankly, it puts me to sleep. But The Beast in the Jungle is a short story and so I managed to get through it and it has actually stayed with me all these years in a haunting kind of way. The Beast in the Jungle is a story about expecting the unexpected. The central character is John Marcher, a rather unremarkable British man of modest fortune living in early 20th century London. Marcher is fixated on the idea that his life will be defined by a singular cataclysmic event. He doesn't know the nature of this event, whether it will be tragic or fortunate, and he doesn't know when it will occur, yet he is utterly convinced that he will be beset by some great and possibly terrible fate, a metaphorical beast lurking in the jungle. His only real purpose in life, he believes, is to wait for that beast to spring. While Marcher is obsessed with the unexpected in an extreme way, I think many of us can relate to his sense of foreboding Especially when life is humming along smoothly, isn't that when so many of us begin to dread the worst? That unknowable but awful thing outside of our control that will destroy our happiness and turn our world upside down. That proverbial phone call in the middle of the night, the beast in the jungle. And we have good reason to forebode, because terrible things outside of our control happen all of the time, and to good people who have other plans in mind. I'm reminded of my father-in-law, Robert. I never met him. He died when my husband Dave was just seven years old. Robert grew up working class in a family of Irish and Italian immigrants in a small New England town. Neither of his parents graduated high school. His father delivered ice. They lived in public housing and struggled to make ends meet. Robert envisioned a better life for his own young family, a more prosperous life. A Navy veteran, he worked multiple low-wage jobs while taking college classes at night. He wasn't home much, but his sacrifices and his families would be worth it, he thought, when he earned his bachelor's degree and embarked on his new career in accounting. He wasn't prepared for the beast that sprung not many months after his graduation, imposing its own version of Robert's destiny. That beast was esophageal cancer. He lived just six months after his diagnosis. He was 37 years old. The cancer beast that took Robert's life redefined the lives of my mother-in-law, my husband, and his two sisters. It's impossible to sort out all the ways his death influenced the course of their lives. Sometimes a terrible beast does spring, as one did for my husband and his family, and perhaps for you or someone you love. Yet, I wonder if we gain anything by waiting expectantly for that beast, as John Marcher does in Henry James's story. Might we risk losing something instead? For years that turn into decades, the entire course of his adult life, Marcher waits for an unexpected big thing to happen in dramatic fashion. Marcher believes that it's this big thing that will give his life meaning, whether that meaning is triumphant or tragic. Instead, he comes to the end of his life and realizes that his fate is to be the man to whom nothing on earth was ever to happen. The beast never springs. Because Marcher spends his life with his sights trained on the big thing, he misses the seemingly small, mundane ways that the unexpected often shows up, with the potential to give each one of our lives its distinctive shape and direction, whether that shape is tragic or triumphant or both or somewhere in the middle. Sometimes the unexpected thing shows up in small moments, inconspicuously, like a tiny seed full of potential. 
For Marcher, that something was the love of May Bartram, a young English woman of similar social rank and unremarkability whom he met and promptly forgot on a vacation in Italy. They happened to meet again 10 years later, and we learn that May is the only person Marcher has ever confided in about his obsession. They develop a lifelong relationship as May agrees to wait with him for the so-called beast. By the story's end, we realize that May has been in love with Marcher, and we realize that Marcher might have had a life, not necessarily remarkable, but one full of passion, intimacy, and love, if only he had noticed the ways that May was offering herself to him, if only he had noticed the tiny seed of love that was trying to take root. But Marcher was so preoccupied with waiting for the big beast that he completely overlooked the tiny seed until May died, and with her the love that never had a chance to bloom. There's another story that has stayed with me since I first read it, and it has a similar message, I think. It's one of the parables of Jesus, the parable of the mustard seed. In the Gospel of Luke, it goes like this. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree and the birds perched in its branches. This, if I can pick it up, this is a mustard seed so tiny you can't see it between my fingers. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Jesus instructs his followers to look for the kingdom of God, the divine salvation which would give their lives ultimate meaning and purpose, not in grand gestures or events, but in the inconspicuous kernels of life that bloom and grow over time. In my own life, I think of how the most deeply meaningful and profound experiences started out as humble, almost imperceptible seeds. Like my relationship with my husband Dave, now 30 years strong, and the family we have together. It all started when I was a sullen 15-year-old, made all the more sullen by a track coach who thoughtlessly assigned me to run the hurdles. Uncoordinated and unathletic, I was terrible at the hurdles. I could barely get over them. The one saving grace was that the practice station for hurdles gave me an excellent view of the varsity baseball team and especially the cute right fielder who caught my eye. Who knew then what lay in store for us? Who knew then what love would bloom? The thing about unexpected seeds is they don't just happen to us. We have to notice them. We have to take them up and plant them and tend to them. We need to give them water and light and nourishing soil in order for them to bloom. I wonder what are the unexpected seeds that have bloomed in your life? What are the seeds that you may be overlooking? that with a little care may take root and grow. We can't forecast the beast that might spring in the form of tragic accidents or diagnoses or even lucky windfalls, but we can take up those small unexpected seeds, those seemingly mundane moments that begin to grow into something more profound. And we can give them our attention and our intention and allow them to grow into the full expression of their potential.